Mini episode 95 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Royalty Tours USA, your ultimate resource to traveling in style to attend sporting events. Follow them on the web at royaltytours.blogspot.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Okay, everybody, it is part five. We're going to be uh, past the, uh, the halfway point here. The nine-part Kyle Ross History of WrestleMania Anthology. It's Rick Morris and Kyle Ross here in the <laughs> FDH the cur- Lounge. Which the current rate could be over by WrestleMania 29. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Ken Burns' miniseries have nothing on us here, No, they Kyle. don't. Yes. <laughs> we see that music, that folksy music. <laughs> yeah. At, uh, we are up to uh, we're up to something uh, easily as tragic, I think anybody would agree, as the Civil War. That being WrestleMania Nine. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> nice yes. Ken Burns analogy yeah, both there. The North and South lost here. Yeah, I think. Yes. yeah. so much so they shipped it out west. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure who was the blue and who was the gray, but it was the fan sensibilities that were getting massacred here, no, Kyle yes, Ross. Thank you. Yes, yes uh, WrestleMania Nine, arguably the worst of all time. I don't believe arguably. I believe is the worst. Uh, it was, but, uh, which, by the way, you know, just for those keeping score at home, I always like to do this. Yeah. Uh, of the first nine WrestleManias, mm-hmm. I have seven of them rated, or pardon me, six of them rated in the bottom ten. Seven in the average group, uh, eight in the uh, good group, and then three up on the top pedestal. Yeah. This this one, uh, not very good uh, for, from a macro level. Let's start there. It was bad. Here, here Look, and, and I think it's important to note, we, we re, you and I did a podcast, I remember vaguely, um, on, on mid '90s wrestling, yeah. '92 to '96, and we, so we, we hit, covered this. Yeah, a lot. we hit this show a lot. Yeah, so I, I, we're not going to spend a lot of time on it. No, because it's it's one of those universal things that everyone agrees this show sucked. It kicked off what had already started the last couple months a bad period. And here's the thing about this WrestleMania. Right. Okay, you talk macro. Yeah, going in, this show is going to suck badly. Okay, it, it, it had nothing interesting on it at all. The main event was certainly of the first nine WrestleMania is the least appealing. Well, this was the post Star Power era. Yeah, I mean Hogan uh, Hogan had left and, and, and he come was back a for the late show. reentry, but yeah, because I they mean, realized, oh my God, no one is going to buy this. Flair was gone. They did the uh, yeah, Leave Town match. That's unbelievable. They, they should have held that. Yeah, why? Why not? I I don't know why you don't hold that off for this show. For yeah. God. Bless America. What was but, the hurry in getting rid of him? Yeah. Yeah, on TV, free TV. Free Jesus. TV, so. Yeah, I know and, they were trying to establish Raw, but, but still. Yeah. Um, this show was going to suck going in, and the boneheaded booking decision, which had they gone through what they actually were looking to do, it's, we'll mm-hmm. talk about it in a minute, would have been okay, but it's made worse by a boneheaded booking decision. I don't mind the venue. I thought the venue was okay, actually. Right. It made, on the History of WrestleMania DVD, they actually spent a great deal of time talking about the production setup at Caesars yeah. Palace. Again, we talk about the early, the, the first several WrestleManias all having kind of a separate identity. When I yeah. think WrestleMania 9, I think two things. Uh, atrocious booking and Caesars Palace. Yeah. So um, It was a cool setting. It was cool. I mean, it, it's unique. Um, it's a small setting, but they probably needed it given you know the, right. the level of interest. I mean, I talked about that. I think the drop off in interest from WrestleMania eight to WrestleMania nine, the greatest between any two WrestleManias there was. I think it probably uh, it probably was. They had made, as we talked about in in our uh, previous mini episode, we were talking about mid nineties wrestling, the most abrupt. Cha- world title change in in the expansion era uh, that ever since the belt went on Hogan in 84 there was nothing even close to what they did in the fall of 92 putting it on Bret Hart I talked about it in our last mini episode yeah okay Bret was being built for that but even I was shocked when they, they came on the syndicated programs yeah. and said he'd won it on a house show in Saskatoon right and I was like what Bret Hart's the world champion right now, be- behind the scenes, Savage had flopped after winning at WrestleMania 8. Right. They wanted to turn the Warrior heel. He balked, wound up leaving the company. And, and Vince, for whatever, it just soured on Flair. Yeah. That Well, keep in mind, too, 
They had to get the belt off of Flair at that time because he had that chip in his inner ear that That's came right. dislodged. Yeah. And he That's was right. able to come back quicker than they thought. But they, they, you couldn't have a world champion who was down for a period of time. So the belt was on Brett. They did him no favors just throwing him into the fray. He was not perceived as a top-level world champion the way that other guys were because people were not conditioned to think of him in that way. I mentioned to you off-air that I was heartened to hear when I was listening to an old SNS, uh, the little guy say something that I've said a lot of times off air, which is, and I might have said it in that mid-90s one, the perfect way to have done it would have been somebody passes the torch to him, say Savage at WrestleMania 9. They didn't want to go another six months of Randy Savage on top, no, apparently. He, yeah, things were not, he, he, that was a bad, he was a bad champion. Yeah, so they, they had to do something, but, but Bret Hart was victimized by the way that it went and ended up being the scapegoat because... Hulk Hogan was the shiny chew toy that came back into the uh, viewing range of Vince McMahon here before this show. Well, in many ways, like a John Cena, okay, yeah. who we're going to get when we get to the end of this thing. Okay? Right. And obviously all the current fans know this. Bad position. You know, he, he's the main guy after a huge boom period. Right. So he's in a bad spot to begin with, done no favors, not really given a, a, a true blood feud right off the rip. Right. You know, he, he was pushed as... They did do a good job, I thought, as push, you know, instead of like a ho it was kind of a jab at Hogan, you know, the, the once a month worker. You know, Bret Hart would defend the title. You know, no one's done a busier schedule. But there was no nothing to sink your teeth into. He wrestles Razor Ramon in a program that had very little intrigue to it at the Royal Rumble uh, that same night. Yeah. They, that was the first year they officially put the number one contendership on the line in the Rumble match. That was a store. Yeah, yeah. The big. And it's a terrible rumble. It's one of the worst ever. Going in, they built up, oh, Yokozuna's pretty unbeatable. Uh, he, you know, he's definitely the odds-on favorite to win. And then he just wins. That's not good, that's not good wrestling right. storytelling. And so you're left with a WrestleMania main event of Bret Hart, Yokozuna. And it clearly, of the first nine, like I mentioned, I would argue maybe ever, had probably as little intrigue for any WrestleMania event ever. I would agree. Because the problem was, but Yokozuna, first of all, is a hackneyed storyline. You know, it's kind of funny. We were just listening to Bill Parcells yeah. at our time <laughs> with, the, with the famous, no offense to Orientals, we like to run Jap plays. Right. You know, the, the idea of the evil Japanese invader was kind of stupid anyway. Right. And to really make this, it didn't help that Bret Hart was Canadian. You know? Right. I remember, like, there was, like, this half-hearted USA chant during this match. Right. And... You know, not, even the announcers are like, Bret Hart's Canadian, you know? Yeah, they it, didn't even have the presence of mind to say, well, his mom's American. Yeah, or yeah. He, which, in, in the grand scheme of things, that ain't going to help, really. Well, I, I mean, yeah. Bret, Bret's, I, the, the funny thing is that for as much as he's been positioned, he's he's really a hybrid American-Canadian. I mean, you're considered American if your well, mom's well, American. Yeah, that's true, but, I mean, he's always wore his Canadian right. heritage on his sleeve. Right. But here's the thing. Like the Rumble where Yokozuna was pre presented. As, and they did do this half-hearted attack. The contract signing Yokozuna bonds, I dropped them. But, I mean, it was like a... What, Generic like, yeah. contract signing, dominant yeah. heel try. Yeah, to it, it was kind of like the match. Already, I was, you know, it was just like, God, like, oh, wow. It was a grab bag of bad cliches that they just applied to this match. Yeah, and the, here's the worst thing, though. Okay, you want to put Brett over? Why doesn't he go over in this match? To me, what like the idea of him losing? I mean, him losing Yokozuna does him no favors. Yokozuna right. is presented as this overwhelming odds-on favorite. Right. You know, they were talking Gene Okerlund, bless his soul. Okay. You know, in the casinos, they're betting Yokozuna right now. That is tremendous. <laughs> okay. That is unbelievable. That is unbe that's a wonderful okay. line. That is unbelievable to play into <laughs> Vegas. Okay, man, and. I guess we just go on right now. All right. Obviously, I, I don't know when the decision was made, how the decision was made. I know what they were going for originally, and it didn't pan out. And it should be noted that that makes this WrestleMania worse, the fallout. The fallout, because obviously Hogan came back. He was involved in a really crappy uh, – the, the match itself is horrific. It's a yeah. negative star affair. And they let it go 18-27. I love how you're always with the times. So we've got it. All. Yeah. But him and Beefcake against Money, Inc. for the tag belts. Right. 
And since they weren't going to be a re- regularly touring team, they, of course, do some awful DQ finish. It, it was, it was the re- which, by the way, we talked about Money, Inc. at WrestleMania 8 also retaining via, you know, extreme screw job. So Yeah, and, and Money, Inc., a- they had lost and won the titles back from the natural disasters during the right. WrestleMania 2. But it's kind of funny, you know, it, it should have set off alarm bells. You know, Hogan, his big comeback, and he's, oh, wow, he just involved. You know, th- that was re- the angle behind that was Money, Beefcake had the parasailing accident. Right. Money, Inc. hit him in the face with a briefcase on an early episode of Raw. This disgusted longtime heel manager, Jimmy Hart, who, yeah. you know, it, it, it coaxed. It was so hideous that Hogan comes out of retirement. Right. <laughs> in reality, bringing Hogan back was desperation because they, they, they looked at this card probably and said, oh, my God, six people are going to order this. And we're uh, and, right. And, and, Four of them have the last name Hart, okay? Yeah. <laughs> so um, so Hogan obviously comes at the end after Yoko's going to win, makes an impromptu challenge, wins the belt in this two-minute match. I will say that it did kind of get the crowd over, and I would have forgiven it had the original plan on the booking sheet was to do the passing the torch match that you talked about that they needed to do so badly for Brett right. at SummerSlam that year. Hogan was going to drop the title to Bret Hart. Mm-hmm. Hogan balked at doing it. And by him doing that, it makes WrestleMania 9 look really bad. It I does. mean, WrestleMania 9 is a show that I think when it initially happened, I I wasn't interested in it at all, but I didn't automatically think worst WrestleMania ever when it happened. And I, I watched the end of the uh, the main event. I, I all I I, I remember I, I got to the sports bar that night after my bowling league and got there. I, I just was there for, like, the last match or so, but that's all I really cared about anyways because it was a horrific card. I remember watching it, and I was somebody that, again, I as shocked as I was that Bret Hart was on top, I mean, even then I, I was – Sort of like an early, early stage. I didn't know what smart markdom was, but and the I, internet had just kind of started. Yeah, really. yeah. But I mean, my I, I I liked it. I liked the change in direction. I remember I had uh, the uh, pink sunglasses at the time. Mm-hmm. I went to uh, I think I got them at Survivor Series uh, ninety two, which was so, here at the yeah, Old Rich Show. I was yeah. at that show. Yeah, Maybe we were sitting next yeah. to each other. Who great, knows? Didn't uh, even know. It was it was a great show. I was probably the guy annoying you with my uh, chance, and you didn't even know it. But yes. uh, <laughs> I was cheering rabidly for Shawn Michaels to win that the was, title. Everyone was like, "Are you really?" Buddy? Do you remember the guy in the flare robe that was at ringside? They, they were like people in costume at this thing. I think I do. Yeah, was yeah. it you? That was no. no. Oh, oh, oh. No, I was. No. Oh, oh, I was like. Oh, I was like. You know, that guy did kind of look like you, Ricky. No, but that's that's outstanding. But no, it was not. No, me. but awesome. I kind of wish it. Yeah, if I were to reveal that to you right now, but no, it was not me. But did uh, that happened in a match. Yeah. <laughs> but we. Uh, so I, I liked the what whole up, Don thing. Peterson. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, Don Don P. Who, by the way, shout out his his rap career is taken off, and I think he's gonna be playing a show at the House of Blues sometime soon. Oh, I'm due to sit down with him here on the on the program. I like so, Don Peterson. Yeah, he's a great good guy. Man. Great guy. Love him to death. Uh, but I was I was buying the whole Bret Hart thing. As shocked as I was early on, I was buying. I it. wasn't. I remember. I, but I, I just here's what happened. I was watching it there. At uh, and this this was at the old Harpo's actually on Brook Park Road. I'm watching it there that night, and then he loses, and I'm kind of bummed. And then Hogan comes in, or whatever, and everybody's everybody's the happy face from the crowd. But and the announcers were selling it. And again, I I was in my early post markdom at the time where I was still trying to make sense of things. But I'm going. Wow, they're like wanting us to react as though this was a year or two ago, but it's not. It's a new era. Well, it's whatever. And and I was like, I was like, are people supposed to feel good at the end of the night that Bret Hart didn't have the title? I was very confused in my early postmark. It was it was funny. I'll give them at least they they tried some things. Dennis Pier. They, right. they, they thought out. You know, they knew by this point. Um, Vince knew things were kind of going in the bad. And and remember. Okay, we had not gotten to the steroid trial yet, okay, in 94. Right. Okay, so Vince had other things on his mind. We were That's limping what, in that direction. Yeah, Vince, you know, the, 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 the not guilty verdict did not come until August of 94. Right. Um, so he had other things on his mind. They tried some outside. Monday Night Raw was just starting here and was was good. Um, but, look, it, it was just gone. And, like, I, the, the Brett Yoke, it was just a bad setup. Brett tried his damnedest in the match. The match is okay, but, you know, to me, if you're trying to establish a number one baby face, he, what, he beats the monster heel. 
So right. it's in Bret Hart, and we'll get to this because this podcast we should talk about is just a two part. It's just we're talking about two wrestling. Ten, yeah. This to me is 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 just pooping. I'm watching my language on this podcast, by okay. the way, for you, Ricky. <laughs> okay, after after dropping two f bombs on the last one, by the way. Go find them, kids. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, after just defecating on the career, this show is just it, 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 the, the, the the booking committee could have easily instead of just having this card play out could have just brought Bret Hart in the ring and defecated on him here's, okay here's and, the and thing, then though. and then a year later part of and we're going to get into a big debate on WrestleMania 10 right. I, I understand was kind of rewriting the wrongs of this show it, it was kind of but 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 here's the thing about that with Bret uh and you had alluded to uh that you had uh, skipped over some parts of his book did you read Bret Hart's critique in his memoirs of this match where, where he's been, and he's a two-time past lounge guest and, God willing, future lounge guest, but I kind of LOL'd at Brett's account of this thing, going off on poor deceased Yokozuna for screwing up the match. According to Brett, there were, like, long sequences of offense for him that were supposed to be in there. He said Yoko basically didn't remember or whatever, Yoko cut to the finishing sequence well before Brett was supposed to get in a lot of his heat sequences. Oh, really? really? That I this was supposed can I tell to go. You something? Yeah. And this is going to. People are like, who are you to say this? Because Brett is usually right on a lot of things. Okay. He, his, his recollection. Because this was much, only 8.55, dude. Yeah. I mean, his recollection is. What? This match is only 8.55? 8.55. Are you sure Bret Hart didn't go on Wikipedia and Eight, change that? 8.55 is what Wikipedia says. Now I don't believe that. I've been there in the past when the likes of Paul Belfi have gone on to Wikipedia and changed things, so I'm not going to say it couldn't have happened. Can somebody out there in Radio Land time, retime this? I'm going to watch. I'm actually going to I don't think that it's 8.55. I remember huh. this being way longer. Shout out to one of our uh, listeners uh, who I know is a Wikipedia mod, uh, Bedford Crenshaw. You might want to look into that, uh, Bedford, and see, did anybody make any changes if on I'm this wrong, recently? If I'm wrong. 855, because uh, Kyle doesn't seem to think that was I the thought it was way, uh, See, because I was going to say, I thought this match was like 20, like 20 minutes. No, this was 855. Does that make it more plausible than when Brett's yes. saying? Yes, okay, now I believe right. Brett. I'm so and sorry, Brett. I will never dispute anything you now say here's, again. Now, here's the thing, too. How does your recollection of this match potentially, and that's all we can say, is how does it change potentially if Brett gets in a lot more heat spots, it's way more evenly contested, if it's more of a classic than it ended up being? It, with still, with Yokozuna look- in there, it has no chance to be a classic. Yokozuna, it was death. Right. Okay? Right. He would get so tired, it would be like the five-minute Vulcan nerve pinch of doom. Right. Okay? To me... It didn't matter how hard Brett worked. To be honest, it would actually have been almost more heartbreaking. Okay. No pun intended. Yeah. If Brett would have worked H-A-R-T. harder, if Brett would have worked harder in here and got screwed, it would have almost been worse because he just gets hosed here, man. And right. and I understand what they're going for. They wanted to do the. It, it, it would be interesting if Brett, if they would have done the Brett Hogan match at SummerSlam '93 that was on the books. Yeah. And Brett goes over and he gets the torch passed to him, and let's just say he has the exact same career. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if that elevates this from not being the worst WrestleMania ever, or to yeah. to, to not being the worst. You know what I'm saying? It, it could affect how we look at this because it, because by that match, I'll tell you this: by that match not happening, it definitely hurts this WrestleMania. Right. I, I will say to me, that's the only thing I focus on. This WrestleMania is just how it just killed Bret Hart dead for a year. Well, and, and, and here's the thing, too. We did a past segment uh, on the uh, on the lounge, and, and you were in for it. Uh, FDH's uh, top 50 pro wrestlers of all time. I, I made the list that. out. I and it was, it was basically by drawing power and success at the box office. And I, I said at the time, you know, and I've always been a big Bret Hart fan, I, you'd have – you'd you'd have a real hard time arguing. By those standards, he was a top 10 wrestler of all time. But he's a guy where, with the right booking behind him, circumstantially, potentially could have had that kind of a career. If he had a different 1993, if he wasn't saddled the way that he was in this year. And he year, did have a fine feud with Jerry Lawler from a right. wrestling, in, a, in, in the wrestling perspective. It was a good storyline. It right. ended kind of with a dud because of Jerry's legal troubles. But, um, you know, he needed that big win that, you know, a lot of people talk about right. whether it be Savage. He needed, you know, it's funny. He beats Ric Flair for the title, but Flair was not a WWE guy. You know, right. it just, it, it just, man, I, I, to me, when 
a, an event that needed to solidify Bret Hart. And again, WrestleMania 10, they rewrite the wrongs. Right. And that is the event that winds up solidifying him right. as the top guy, although it's a year too late. It, it, it just, it's bad, man. And Yokozuna sucked, okay? Yeah. I, I, I mean, I can't stress enough how if you were to list from the single belt era, right. you know, I'm talking about before they did the brand split right. thing in like 02, my least favorite world champion ever. Yeah. I, I think it's Yokozuna. He, I, he was so bad when he, he got the belt. He was just so bad. Like, it was so uninteresting and just like bad. A guarantee you got to get, like, there's no world champion in history, I think, of this company. Right. Where you were guaranteed to have a bad match. Right. Guaranteed. Well, and, and I mean, it was his way. I mean, look, he's not going to move around. It was just bad. And, and, and the funny thing is, is that, you know, when, when you look at the outcome of that show, for as much as I poop on Hulk Hogan professionally and personally these days, look, I'll admit it. When I was a kid, when I was a mark, I, I was into Hulk Hogan. I was into Hulkamania, you know, rah, rah, sis, boom, bah. So it's a thing. But that's what makes it more striking. And maybe that's where it started to mark an evolution in my own thinking. Because at the end of that show... It was one of those things where I, I was just I was going, I'm supposed to be happy right now, but well, I'm really know, not. And I, I, w- I was really confused by that because they they generally I mean, those announcers say what you will about by the way, them. By, by the way, this is Jim Ross's debut at the company, right. a real car crash commentary team of J.R., Heenan and Savage that did not work too well. I mean, Heenan right. was doing his shtick. Right. Jim Ross did not sell for him like Monsoon did. Right. Randy Savage would just like yell things randomly like he hadn't been paying attention for 5 minutes. And I'm not going to bl- so I'm not going to blame this on on J.R. or Heenan or whatever. I don't think it wouldn't have been any different had Monsoon been in there because you know, it, well, it was all about it was all about the booking as opposed to like there was nothing that they could do to sell the booking. But you know what I'm it talking was, it was about? about this, the this. narrative, the narrative that the announcers always gave. It was like Pravda, and I would lap it up along with the rest of the fans back in the day. This was like one of the first times I could remember where it was like they're acting like I should be real happy right now. But I'm not really that happy. Well, I, I I'm kind of confused. I think they were going, and they've done this throughout history, you know, starting with just yeah. like a shock move. You know, it, it was a dud WrestleMania going in. I think they felt but it was that they, so unprecedented. And, and they, they just, yeah. And, and from that perspective, okay, it's like, you know, it was funny. When, you, when I learned the results, I, I didn't go to a sports bar. and those, mm-hmm. I, I just learned I, my, my interest was waning at that point, and it was, you know, I mean, you talk about dropping interest. My in, level of interest going in this WrestleMania was certainly at an all-time low when I learned that Hogan had won, I was like, what? How, like, he, he wasn't in the world. Like, how does that happen? He wasn't right. in a world time. And, and they were just going for Hogan's back, and he's the champ. And, wow. and it kind of worked. But the problem was, again, the fault. He never appeared on Monday Night Raw. Yeah. I mean, the, the, what, what a slap in the face. Well, not a live appearance anyways. They might have done some tape stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, again, anyone who criticizes me criticizing Hulk Hogan, this is the period where it got thick. You know what it was, too? Hogan treated being champion like it was still the superstars era, where you, you do your pre-tape every couple weeks or whatever. It and wasn't he wasn't treated like it was his birthright. Yeah. Like, it was no big deal for him. Oh, yeah, I'm back. I'm the champion. That's the way it should be. In the syndication days, it would be like, okay, you've made your appearance on T, your token appearance for a month or six weeks yeah. or whatever. He didn't quite get that Raw was a different era. I don't think any of us fully internalized how much differently it was going to be, but you're right. It was a smack in the face. They were moving towards the weekly episodic television, which, by the way, side note as we're getting into this mid-90s period the steroid trial was going to be upcoming you had uh jerry jarrett that was enmeshed in the booking there they were trying to get more episodic and weekly in the tennessee style in the memphis yes. style that's where waller and they, not so much waller waller was just on, on commentary at the time but well, jerry well, jarrett feeding, in particular yeah he's feeding with, you know, he feeding with Bret Hart. well yeah, yeah. wrestling i i meant though that he wasn't booking oh okay, that, that okay jarrett, sure, was, sure, jarrett yeah. was the only uh creative influence uh, that, yeah, that but was, there definitely was. was. Yeah, and, and and you know even even yeah. Cornette later, you know, right. brought in his own unique style. Oh so. yeah, yeah. There was you know in a full crossover later in the year with Smoky Mountain, which was like unprecedented to openly, God of all the. 
promotions in the world that they're going to openly acknowledge, you could have made a nice buck betting that it was going to be Smoky Mountain. Yeah, yeah. Although, again, they didn't perceive Smoky Mountain as a threat. Yeah, that's probably why. You they, know. they didn't even acknowledge the USWA openly. Vince would, like, although go to Memphis. With, although he worked with them. Like, but exactly. But, like, he would go there and never acknowledge it on their own TV, yeah, which was yeah. hilarious. Uh, yeah. Let's just touch on the undercard stuff here uh, it's, it's, I mean, in passing. Horrible, horrible undercard. Uh, Tatanka keeping his undefeated streak going, defeated Shawn Michaels, Intercontinental Champion, by count out but it was in 18 so, 13. Uh, this is the best match on the show. It is not, it's about two and three quarters. But this is like that lame booking they get themselves into now where yeah. they wanted to preserve Tatanka's undefeated streak, but he certainly was not at the caliber to be beating Shawn Michaels for a yeah. title. So, hey, let's do a big non finish. Luke yeah. Shawn's debut, by the way. Yeah, that was, exactly. And uh, Sherry was and, and with To uh, be Tatanka. honest, this match was kind of the big. Um, yeah, it, it was kind of a, a backdrop for pushing right. Luna attacking Sherry. Yeah, and that yeah, face Sherry, which only ever worked like right she after, left. Yeah, she, right after a turn. Yeah, it was kind she, of a blow she off. She left. She left pretty quick to go to WCW anyway. The only waste of Michaels, even though he tried, man, he tried big, big waste. Uh, Tatanka is just uh, too big a piece of Samsonite to be able to carry. Yeah, and you and I talked about the, of all the people to be getting to to get a year and a half unbeaten streak yeah. in this company. What Chris Chavez ever did to deserve it? I don't know. Did he have nude pictures right. of Vince McMahon with a horse? Yeah, I, I don't know. I think they just. I think they they looked at his look, and I think he had the arm tassels and whatever. And they're thinking maybe like because he's an Indian, go with a warrior type hey, character, ultimate warrior. Hey, yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I think I think it was an early attempt to rip off their own ultimate warrior thing, and yeah. it didn't work at all. He didn't have a fraction of the charisma, and he had only a. Hair above work rate. Yeah, he never had like, a that. great match. Or his work rate sucked. Uh, Steiner Brothers, one of the great tag teams of all time. Their only WrestleMania match. They defeated the Head Shrinkers at fourteen twenty-two. A match that should have been better than it was. You know, this if this was them against the Samoan SWAT team in nineteen ninety in WCW, this might have been three and a half stars. <laughs> you know, it's it's pretty close. To the, this is not a bad match. I, I have nothing bad to say right. about this. It it was what it should have been. Putting the, Steiner, uh, yeah. the Steiners getting a good pay per view win. Shades of the Can Ams getting the win at uh, WrestleMania three. This was the Steiners getting a win to set them up for the tag. Yeah, team it was too early. To it was too early to put the belts on. Couldn't they, do they, it yet. Yeah, yeah. They, had, they had just debuted like two, three yeah. months earlier. So yeah, yeah we, we got to give them a win on pay per view. Yeah. Everyone and their mother knew they would eventually beat Money Inc., which they did. Yes. Know, in the, June. This this was the stepping stone match. Uh, Doink the Clown defeated Crush at 828 as another Crush came out, and I believe No, you mean another Doink. Or another Doink came this out, is a and there much was an malign- arm that... This is malign. I hated that feud. I just... Uh, I thought... I, well, here's the problem. People think that like Crush could have been this number two baby face. No. I, I disagree. And that's why I don't care about it, because I'm not one of those people. He I was awful. I, I loved Heel Doink, by the way. Heel yeah. Doink was, I thought, tremendous. I... I thought it was funny when they were doing the pantomime, you know, when they were like the two links and right. Bobby Heenan's like, it's an illusion, you know, it's it's, just <laughs> a, it's the David Copperfield, he's better than Copperfield, yeah. you know, it was over the top, it was silly, it was a clown, but it was kind of a surprise fit. I, Doink drew some good, I loved heel Doink, so it was nice to see him go over. But 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 here's the thing, but though. It, it's a it's a it, nothing match that, that that did a lot of harm to Crush. Well, and and, and that was my biggest problem with it because. I never thought that much of Crush, but they did, and they ruined him. And this didn't do him any favors. They ruined him without making... Because they made him look like that dumb baby face. Right, without making Doink into a money-drawing character in any way. Yeah, it, you, a, you destroyed somebody without accomplishing anything. Yeah, he kind of like had a ceiling to him in that game yeah. like, and turning I, him baby face. Bad move, bad move. Uh, Both guys would be in r- different roles by the next WrestleMania, by the right, way. Right, they, they, they would be. Uh, Bob Backlund in the next match here. I would have put him in with Shawn Michaels and let Michaels go over clean. I think it could have been a good kind of a uh, uh, a thing here to help establish Michaels as, as an Intercontinental Champion. Instead, he gets into a match with no program whatsoever against Razor Ramon. This was right before they they ended up turning Ramon face. He wins clean at 345 in a match that just accomplished nothing. Crowd kind of cheered for the heel Ramon, booed the fan. 1993 Bob Backlund is abysmal. He sucked so bad. They dragged it out way too long before they turned him heel. Here's a problem, though, too. I, as I was looking back at his career... He came in like in the lest we forget in the fall of '92 and didn't turn heel until late summer '94. 
He was on and off of TV, start and stop, start and stop the whole time. He was bad. There was man. never any. No one liked working with him at all. Yeah, I, I, well, it was an anachronistic style. He was working the late '70s style. It just didn't work. Uh, of the other matches we haven't touched on yet, this one I was telling you off here. I thought they had a chance to do so much with this. Lex Luger and Mr. Perfect, Kurt Hennig. It ends up being Luger winning the match. But I mean, to, to people like me that grew up on the after mags in the '80s. This would have been like tantamount to kind of like a dream match, kind of. And and and, and they, you know, Luger came in. It was funny, and, and this was, was interesting. They did an angle that was kind of just forgotten about because Luger does the huge face turn in the summer, right? Where Luger had attacked Bret Hart. Remember the the big angle was Luger the the, the loaded forearm, right. That he hit people with, right? And he had laid out Bret Hart at the WrestleMania news conference, yeah. So it kind of was like, and I think we talked about this in our last podcast that it seemed that you know why not just put Bret over. Yokozuna and have him feud with Lex Luger in the right. summer. The you know, and maybe it was because Henning kind of felt that he shouldn't be putting Luger over. That maybe he kind of phoned it in here. Yeah, maybe that had something to do with it. But it was a, it was a crappy ending, and it was a, a disappointing match. There's a good brawl that happens between uh, Michaels and Perf- Shawn Michaels and Mister Perfect to kick off their feud. Right after this, but uh, it's a, it's narcissist was a horrible gimmick for Luger. It was a thing typical WWF of where they they would pigeonhole you into a one-dimensional thing where they only wanted you to think of like one thing with the character. Yeah, it's like because you know he's, he's so egotistical. He just wants mirror. Yeah, was... heel Luger in WCW prior to that coming in. Yeah, he was stuck up, but there were other aspects to him. This was mm-hmm. just bad pigeonholing. Undertaker, in one of his worst WrestleMania matches, defeated Giant Gonzalez in the painted or in the, in the muscle suit by disqualification. Muscle suit with hair, by the way, or fur. The only whatever. match during the streak did not win. Did not actually pin him. You know, okay. it's kind of funny. You know, I mean, I guess he won. Yeah. You know, to continue the streak, but did not get the pinfall. Although in. Uh, what was it? Uh, Why does anyone re- cut a promo on him like that? If Undertaker's going to make these pseudo, these quasi shooter marks, oh, you're not as good as Sean. Uh, Triple H, I believe, should come out and really get one for the smart marks. Oh yeah, well, you won by disqualification at WrestleMania Nine. Well, this this is one of two. Giant Gonzalez is one of two guys that the Undertaker did not pin at WrestleMania. I can't think of who the other one was. This is kind of a trick uh, question. Well, if it's a trick question, how can you not think of the answer? Because I don't know which guy it was. Hint, WrestleMania 19. Oh, yes. yes it was a, he, a handicap yeah, that's match. right. It was a handicap did match. He, who did he pin? Did he pin uh, Albert or did he pin Big Show? Didn't I tell you uh, the, the weed had set in by that point? I remember WrestleMania <laughs> 6 a lot better than 19. I don't All remember. Right. Yeah, but All he, I know is Nathan Jones. I'm sure it had to be Albert. Yeah. I, I It probably your, was. Your boy. It, <laughs> yeah. That, they could have done more with Albert. And he's had a nice yeah, career. Yeah, like job him out quicker. He's had a nice career in Japan, though. What do you make of that? Yeah, it ain't exactly. Giant the, Bernard? Yeah, it ain't exactly the, uh, you know, 90. He's doing very yeah, good. Yeah, Toshiaki Kawada's not walking through that well. door. That much. <laughs> and speaking, of, speaking of the uh, 03 era, I've always uh, said, and I, I commented on the show back in the day, Nathan Jones, they really, really missed out. They could have gone with the real life thing. This was a guy who actually kind of lactated a little bit out of his man boobs. You make that part of your gimmick, Kyle Ross. How do you, how do you miss on that? You know, like after he beats a guy, he lactates on him a little bit. Obviously, no one gave Vince that idea because I can see him going through with that. Yes, <laughs> and he should have. He should have. But that's what he gets for not having me whispering these in his ear. And that takes us to uh, Yokozuna uh, Hart, which we already talked about, and uh, Hogan Yokozuna afterwards. So we, we made our way through this horrible card. It is a card that, as you said... It is the, the worst WrestleMania. It's, yeah. in, it's in that bottom quintet. Uh, that, that WrestleMania 1 and 2 right. um, would be a part of... We talked about those. Those are kind of towards the top of those. Um, WrestleMania 9, for me, is the worst WrestleMania. And here, here's the thing, too. When you look at the early WrestleManias, there would be a lot of times a road map from one WrestleMania to the other that, okay, even if we didn't know it at the time, as we talked about, hindsight, yeah, you could see it from Savage winning to Hogan Savage the next year. You could see certain things happening. We thought Hogan Warrior was going to lead to Hogan Warrior 2. It didn't. But... Instead, at that one, it was Warrior Savage, and this is where it started to really get unpredictable. Who would have predicted Savage, after losing a retirement match, wrestling for, for the championship next year in the co-main event? From here, at WrestleMania 9... He's on commentary. He's on, yeah, and then he's on commentary uh, at this one. 
equal unlikelihood, because we're talking about Bret Hart here, who has just gone through this very dispiriting, I'm not going to say burial, uh, because he went on to win King of the Ring. They thought they hadn't damaged him that much. They were wrong as they saw King of the Ring, though, King of the Ring, though, was Vince being like, oh, boy, I done screwed up. Because he, they, 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 where are we going? Are we going into are we transitioning to WrestleMania Christ. 10? We, we are. Okay. We are. All right. I just want to make sure, because I, I, I was going to say I can take us there, but yeah, I wanted yeah. to make sure no, that's no. where you wanted me that's to go. That's where we're going. Okay. I'm, I'm talking about the unpredictable path of Bret Hart in that next year. Oh, see, I think this one is a lot better than, than, than some of those other ones uh, as far as the predictability. I think you could see it because Vince, as soon as he realized that Hogan had no interest in putting Bret over, as soon as he realized he had no interest in being a Monday Night Raw, he's like, what have I done? Oh, my. I, I, I think he quickly learned. He made a terrible mistake. If he was that remorseful, he wouldn't have decided that Lex Luger was going to be the next franchise baby face in a panic move. Well, because, yes, that, that's a very good point, and I don't have an answer for that right now. But <laughs> King of the Ring, but well, yeah, well, no, hold on. Okay. No, you, hold, you hold the phone, Rick Morris. Okay. <laughs> King of the Ring occurred before that. Yes. And, you know, Brett being, again, being Canadian. I don't know when. Look, I don't know when. Brett went out and had three amazing matches yeah, at, King at that the, pay-per-view. Yeah, that was and, to. And did everything he was supposed and to do. And you're right. Long term, I don't know what Vince was thinking after that. Because he, he puts him in the feud with Jerry Lawler after that show. Right. A very good feud. He sets up a good feud. He jobs Hogan to Yokozuna. Right. So we basically have erased WrestleMania 9. Yokozuna's the champ. Lex, so Brett is, remains. Brett, against all odds, this is a testament to what a performer he was. And this is important, I think, when we talk about WrestleMania 10. Stays very over. He has a good feud. Jerry Lawler, it's not like this incredible money-drawing feud, but in a wrestling sense, the classical sense, a great feud. But Brett's starting to look like 1A for life at this point. Yes. But, again, a testament to his own skills, though, he stayed really, really over. Right. Okay, only because he's as good as he is. Luger gets the traditional Vince McMahon mega push out of nowhere. Turns face, slams him on the Intrepid on 4th of July, gets the SummerSlam match where he probably should have gotten the title in hindsight. Yes. Because it stalled all his momentum and he didn't get it. He wins by count out. In a match where they said ahead of time there would be no rematch. Well, I know. For the love of God. Well, here's the plan, though. Here's the thing. The idea all along, they had a very long-term thing. He was going to get the title at WrestleMania. He was, and the way he was going to get it was by – because remember – now everyone would be on to it because the, everyone just knows about the Rumble, about right. how you win it, you get the title shot. Their thing was he's going to win the Rumble, and he'll get the t- that's how he gets the title shot. Right. A funny little thing happened away, along the way, and I've read a lot of the observers um, recently talk about this period. They tried so hard to keep him over at the level that Brett was staying over, staying at, they couldn't do it. Luger, man, the crowd was just cold. Just kept getting as the months went on, they just kept getting colder and colder and colder with him. And it became obvious as they rolled into the Royal Rumble, Ricky, that Bret Hart, who had kind of started this thing with Owen now, okay, Owen turns on him earlier in the show, that Bret was more over than Lex. They do the famous tie finish at the Royal Rumble. And they let the cra- and Vince and this is where I want to get in. Now we get into WrestleMania ten. Yes, I wrote about this on your blog last year. Ballsy booking on this show, outside the box booking. I loved. The, I really liked the booking of the show because I said WrestleMania nine was them defecating on Bret Hart. Yeah, this was them taking a large wad of toilet paper and cleaning up the mess because. They had built in, and they had to stick with it because they don't. They, they back then they respected their long term vision still, mm-hmm. which is important to note, and I re, and I respect them their respect. They had this big plan that Luger's going to get the title. Along the way, they it just becomes painfully obvious to anyone with you know a set of eyes and a pair of ears that Bret Hart is more over than Lex Luger. Right. Okay. Despite what happened the previous year, despite that he's in this kind of one A feud with Lawler. So they're in a situation then where Vince listens to the audience after the Royal Rumble. It becomes painfully obvious that Brett is, the, is his number one baby face, not made in the USA, Lex Luger. So they do the dual title matches. Right. And I thought it was so... I, 
I really like this. I you, again outside the box. I, you, we're gonna have a good debate because you you think I'm crazy for thinking this. To me, this is the th- I think this is the third best WrestleMania ever. Only, only three and seventeen are better than this one. I think. I mean, I guess my whole thing is 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 that you you've got the two matches that are you're calling them five stars, and I guess I'm not gonna argue with you on that. But I'm just wondering how far that takes you on the historical continuum. Because in just looking at this, I don't think I'd wipe my ass with the rest of the card. So, okay, again, what do we know about rest? Well, here's the thing, though. It's the combination of the two matches, and then for me, righting the wrongs, setting it. It's like, hey, Bret Hart's the champ. Yeah. And, and then Bret getting – Bret, the, the narrative of Bret Hart on this show is unbelievable, I think. From him starting on the opening match, losing to Owen Hart in the in the first of two five star matches this card would see, and establishing his brother as a main eventer in the process. Card. Owen Owen was a complete joke going into the show. Yes. Not a joke because he was well pushed, but he was a, he, he was viewed as a non player by the audience at large. Kind of like a, a he had been a JTTS for years, and no one bought him as having a chance. He right. pins him clean in a five star match, right? Uh, which isn't even the best match on the show. Um, and then Brett would go on. You know they. they they, well, first of all, it was the, the double title match. They set it up where there would be a coin. You know, one guy would wrestle Yokozuna first. The other guy to offset that would have to have a match. Mm-hmm. Um, Luger's opponent was Crush. It was going to be his schedule with a little trivia, if you didn't know that. I didn't know that. Okay, okay. which would have, of course, been absolutely terrible and would not have been a five-star match to lead off the show. Um but everyone knew that. Like, when they announced that it would be Brett or Owen or Luger, it, come on, which way do you think it's going to go, right. right? So. Would have been funny if they had uh, forgotten the gimmick. Coin. Yeah, yeah, and they're like, ah! <laughs> well, I think it might have been a tape draw anyway. But um, yeah. So they do it. Luger gets the first shot. Here it is. After eight, nine months, Luger finally gets his you know, big rematch at Yokozuna. They do the special referee gimmick. Mr. Yeah. Perfect comes back screws Luger, he disqualifies him for kind of no reason, for putting his hands on him. Right. And Luger, well, that's it, man, for you. And and see, usually I feel bad for guys in that spot, but not Lex Luger, okay? They, they gave this guy every push imaginable. It didn't pan out. Hit the bricks, pal. And then... Well, I want to play a little bit of devil's advocate on that because with what they did at SummerSlam, it's a thing where... 93, the previous... SummerSlam one. 93... You know, I, I'm sure Vince would sit here and say, I'm not culpable for what went on outside of here, but Lex Luger in the kayfabe sense, more than anybody that I can think of from that period of time, had the rap of can't win the big one because they always did the screw job finishes with him and Flair. Yeah. He only ever won the belt when Flair wasn't there. Lex Luger didn't have the margin of error to have that cheesy SummerSlam finish. I think that doomed him in the eyes of the fans. I honestly it, think so. It, it, it did, but in the end... It I, came out to a better place, but you know, let, let's I, not I don't, act like it was any I grand d- plan. I don't think he was... It was des- a screw-up that worked out in their favor. I don't think he was deserving of having a better legacy. No, he wasn't necessarily, but it was... I, to me, like when I watch like him kind of like... In like you know, they do the, Vince McMahon does one of his patents on commentary. And Lex Luger is now in the ring... Standing there, defeated, and, and like I laugh, like I, 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 like I'm like rolling on the ground, saying, "Oh my God, Larry!" You know, however you pronounce his last name, <laughs> Fall. yeah, Larry Fall. They, 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 the promotion done did you again, you know? Yeah. And then at the end of the night, Roddy Piper's a special guest, and and, and Brett is rightfully put as the world champion, ending the horrific reign of Yokozuna, and the right guy comes out on top, and you have this wonderful coming out of the show, wonderful main event program of Brett versus Owen because Owen had beaten Brett. The early, I mean, that to me was it, I I love the booking of this show. Right. Owen Owen winning in the Brett losing in the first match to his brother clean only to go on and win the title. I thought I love love that booking. All right, here's the thing though. Normally that doesn't work, you, but it did here. You, it did here work. And they screwed over and and normally I don't like the, I don't justify them screwing over guys who have been pushed, but the right guy got screwed over, the right guy got put over. Luger is Wally Pip. That's exactly what this is. And 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 Bret Hart was Lou Gehrig. And but deservingly so, like would Wally I mean would Wally Pip have been one of the greatest first basemen of all time? If if you probably not or if you prefer 
Uh, Tom Brady, Drew, Drew Bledsoe. Would, That's the same would thing. Would Drew Brady have been? You know, Drew, I thought Drew you Brady. can't lose your job because yeah. of an injury. Yeah, Drew Bledsoe. Well, he didn't lose it because he, he didn't. I know. He wasn't was, injured. He just wasn't as talented you know, and not as over. He was injured by the booking. But, uh, <laughs> he, yeah, but the crowd didn't take to him. Like the, it was, the, to the me, crowd was influenced by the booking, though. The crowd, oh, here, here he goes again, man. Look, here he goes you're again. Right. You're right. Yeah. The, the fact that he does not win the title at SummerSlam 93 right. did not help him. They should, in retrospect, have put the title on yes. him right away. Yes. Um, where they go from there, I don't know. Oh, well. But to me, it's one of those things that it worked out for them. It did. In the end. Can't disagree. And I, I love the booking of that. I, yeah. I love the, narr- the Bret Hart narrative well, on the show. Before we start to move down the card, let me just ask you this, because it sounds like you're, uh, you're either overestimating or maybe you think I'm underestimating the impact of the booking of Bret Hart here, because I look at it like, you know what, because of the previous 18 months, it was, it was irretrievable, I think, at that point for me that he was going to be a company anchor. Or are you saying that I'm looking at it because of revisionism because of what came after 94? Do you think I'm re- being a revisionist because I, they did it to him again in 95 I think you just have unreali- I think you just have unrealistic expectations for Bret Hart. I, I think that if you would have booked Bret Hart perfectly. Yeah. He's and a fringe top ten guy of all time, I think, he, booked perfectly. He would not have... As a care- draw. As a draw. Even. He would not have... Bret Hart, booked perfectly, yeah, is not going to yield the results Hulk, of Hulk Hogan. No, okay? no, of course so not. So if you accept that, okay, then, then WrestleMania 10 to me, is his kind of finest out. To me, but, that was him at his peak. Right. Now, but, you're right. They did him. He, he kind of, that was his big, you know, the first title reign, no one really, and he's, I think, admitted this. I did read right. this part. The first title reign was kind of like, okay, it, it, you know, Ric Flair's talked about a lot of times, you know, winning the belt the first time really means nothing. It's yeah. being, it's it's winning it again shows the promotion thinks you're a guy who can carry the ball. It's a feeling out process yes. the first time. So the first time meant nothing. His best run, I think, when he was comfortable and his most happy in the yeah. company was this second title run in 94 when he was working with Owen in the main events. Right. This was the pinnacle of Bret Hart. Those shows did okay. I mean, for that era, I mean, look, I mean, it wasn't Hogan Andre, but they didn't Yeah, I mean, that's unrealistic yeah, to think but... that they could have done Hogan Andre. No, it's true. That's true. It's just, if, if he was drawing better, he'd have had the belt for he more than eight okay months. He was drawing okay in 94, though. I mean, relatively speaking. Not good enough to keep the belt from going to Diesel in Vince's mind. Well, I think there was some, well, that was, that was a whole year and a half. No, oh, no. That was like, Survivor Series 94, yeah, 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 he yeah, lost a yeah, back one tra- yeah, transitional. Yeah, sure, yeah. Well, all I can – well, I mean, he had been champion for like eight months, though, at that point. But here, here's the thing, though. Here's the thing. There's – And who drop knows – the belt, and who knows, and There's who, drop the belt to get it back. But when it's drop the belt to a transitional heel champion who drops the belt to a new anchor guy, yeah. you ain't getting it back. You're back to 1A. I'm just saying. That I, didn't help his case, but to me – Look, I look. There could have been dirty politics in play. I mean, that's okay. when that, that's when there were the, the so ill you seem feelings. To, you seem to think I'm looking at it at revisionist eyes. That if you just look at it as of WrestleMania 10, that it was still that it was not irretrievable for Brett to be much bigger than he ended up being in the eyes of history. You're saying that WrestleMania 10 could have put him on a much better trajectory had it not been for the things that came afterwards. I'm saying if I look from a kayfabe sense of Brett's yes. career, WrestleMania 10 is his pinnacle. Oh yeah, I would agree with that. That's what I, that's I, all I would, I'm saying. I would agree. That's all I'm and, saying. And he from finally the kayfabe, avenged. Yeah, from the he, kayfabe sense, the the wrong, you know, Vince even, who's not, you know, never been accused of being the nicest man in the world, yeah. the nicest boss even, even kind of threw him the bone. And, and Brett said this before in interviews that it was pretty cool how like all the everyone, all the baby faces come out. Even Luger comes out, right? And they put him on his shoulders, and they're and, and they, it's kind of like. Okay, Brett's the man. Like, you never felt right. like he was the man the first title reign. Right. Brett, Brett Hart is the, look, WWF, maybe he's not Hulk Hogan. Maybe he's never going to be Hulk Hogan, even right. if we try our best. But, damn it, Brett Hart is the man right okay. now in the WWF. And for that moment and that year, that was the right move. It was. Diesel was not the right move. Brett Hart was, yes, late in 95, by, or by, even by the end of 94, was given lousy booking again. And he was right. given lousy booking in 93. Right. You know? But Bret Hart, to me, from late 92 to at some point in 95, 
was the whether he was a champion or not was the best guy in the company. All right. Well, we we have the semi main to get to okay. before, and as well as the undercard things after that. The se- semi main to those three bouts we already talked about here. Let me ask you this, because the guy who was in the semi main. If we're talking about company philosophy at the time. Uh, this was a uh, ladder match to unify the two claims to the Intercontinental title. Razor Ramon, Shawn Michaels, the other five-star uh, match, as you called it, in 1847. For Razor, here's how I always looked at it at the time. That it was a thing where, because we know that Vince vacillated between, I'll go with Brett and later on Shawn, and then, ah, i got to go back to the big guys. I'm, I'm always fascinated that Razor didn't get a look because he was sort of a hybrid. He wasn't as good of a worker as Brett and Sean. He wasn't as big as Diesel. Razor, to me, was was less all or nothing than either end of the spectrum. I'm trying. And he had a lot of charisma. He did, and, and I kind of saw where you were going with that yeah. early on in your in your very nice soliloquy there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, what, what's your answer for that, as best as you can think? I'm, try, I'm trying to think of a point of comparison from the 80s for the Razor Ramon level because I never bought you know remember we talked about the early like the kind of that Jim Duggan Jake Roberts level of baby face where yeah he was always real high but you never bought him as going to be the world champion that's so you're saying that I never as opposed to like Piper never got the title but he was he would have been credible as champion. You're saying he was somewhere in between those two levels. Razor okay. Ramon. Um, because I'll, I'll give you that. Yeah, I, I, I because I I, I believe I never, he was I never okay. during his tenure and he was very over. Very he, over. he was tr- for 2 years he was the number 2 baby face in the company yeah. when they were rotating the number 1. Okay? Yeah, yeah. You know Sean, you know Sean kind of started as 3 and then you served him to go to 1. Brett right. was 1 and kind of fell back to 3. Yes. Um but I never viewed, and maybe it's because he was always feuding for the Intercontinental title anyway the whole time. Yeah, the perception's reality, yeah. and the IC had really taken a dip in the eyes of the fans. Well, yeah, 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 I guess so. Yeah, it, it had, because there just wasn't the depth. But right. I never, at no point at the time, and no point looking at things from a revisionist perspective, Okay. did I ever say, you know what, Scott Hall should have got a run maybe for the world title right there. In terms of revisionism, don't you have to say he should have gotten a look well before Diesel? At least in terms of revisionism. Throw me that bone. I don't know because Nash. You're going to say he was neutered, and he was. No, Nash. But he, just, he sucked as a worker. Yeah, yeah but that they, they, when have they cared? When has that mattered? Except for like, you know, a, a few minutes. Here, here's the problem, though. They're, none of their heels could work. They didn't have heels that could carry Nash. Yeah, they didn't. Yeah, all of his good matches were against, you know, when they worked against Babyface Brett. Right. Um, it's one of those things that, like, with a draft, like, yeah. in the NFL, and it, you're, you're going with the guy with, the, they always say, the higher upside. Right. Okay, he's got bigger bust potential, okay. you know, like, with quarterback. That's the thing with Nash. Ramon has a certain ceiling that he was never going to get beyond. So you're saying, like, if he's a cornerback, he's a guy that's going to make the Pro Bowl three times over the course of his career as opposed to being a champ Bailey? Yes. Okay. Exactly. All right. Exactly. Diesel had champ Bailey upside in the eyes of him. Yeah, but he – because, I mean, you said it yourself, he was bigger. Okay, he was bigger. Literally all he had going for him. Yeah, he was. I mean, a nice nice dry dry humorous charisma. Yeah, again, he's a guy, too, that – you know, legacy wise, I'm not sure where you. I mean, you know, yeah. There, there was. Here's the thing. Here's what I say. There is a retros looking at things through hindsight. Right. When you look at the three original NW, this is way off the beaten path. Right. The, the three original members of the NWO, Hogan, yeah. Hall, Nash. There is a very clear pecking order in retrospect how those guys stand. Hogan, Nash. Hall. Right. No one would dispute kind of the pecking order and the power structure. No, nobody would. And well, Hall wasn't the politician those guys were either. No, no, he wasn't. And he also was a complete drunk and a, and a drug addict. He was. Which and, and you know, shouldn't be joking Arguably about. at times more so than these other guys. But yeah. th- this was a real quick battle here uh, between the three yeah. guys. And interesting in, in the eyes of history, you made a nice uh, you know contribution to the segue here. This was the last moment of Diesel's career 
before he became something. Because after this, he would get into a feud with Razor for the Intercontinental title. And he Razor, would win. Yes. And, and Michaels Razor, took time off. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm still not sure if he was injured or just did it to get out of the way for Diesel. I, I can't yeah, remember the I, story I, behind that. I, I, th I think it was a combination of time off, mm -hmm. wanted to try doing uh, Heartbreak Hotel. Uh, Diesel was doing, uh, you know, the, the single stuff here. So th this was this was the end of... Of the first phase of Diesel's yeah, gets, career, which was basically nothing. Yeah, he's basically he yeah, was they in were going to fire corner. him. They yeah. give him the Diesel push, which at obviously didn't Rumble, exist, yes. you know, at the Royal Rumble. Yeah. But that said, I mean, they must not have thought much because they throw him out of the match early. He's yeah. in Michael's corner, and then man, you know, the younger, uh, not to be like old folk on the corner right. wave, you know, yelling <laughs> at the kids in the lawn. The younger fans seem to not take to this match, Michael's Ramona Lana match, as much as like people from our generation. That's because they, pr I'm assuming. Even me, because I was watching, and I'm like, does this really hold oh, up? I, I, here's I just... the thing, though. I, I talked, to, I kind of made fun of people who like overrate influences, I think, in one yeah. of the world pocket. Man, I remember when this happened. I watched, I must have the next day, I must have watched this match like six times. Like, it's, yes, the bumps have gotten bigger, but there has to be a starting point. And when this match happened, it's just like when any other, like, great, like, to me, the latter matches have been, have been decreasing in impact because you've seen it all. They, they, they obviously, the, the concept reached its peak with TLC, right. with Edge and Christian and the Dudleys and the that Hardys. The that, that would that, that reached. But as far as a solo ladder match goes, I'll put this up against any solo ladder match you, that ever happened. You, as a matter of fact, I believe it's the best. Do you hear any... Uh, comparisons. I, I, Any this, similarities between you saying that and our good pal Jake Digman saying that superstar Billy Graham would have been Hulk Hogan better than Hulk Hogan? Do you, do you hear any comparisons in, in talking up the original to that extreme? I think it's a little different. Okay. Because I, I'm what sure Jake you do. said is wrong, first of all. <laughs> okay. Um, we uh, start from that point. <laughs> okay. And there's some comparison in that there wouldn't have been Hulk Hogan without superstar Billy Graham. Okay. Just like there wouldn't have been TLC. Clearly. Without this. But. This. It just can't be. I, I just remember the period. And, okay. And you can't just because. It's. It, 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 for, for the time period it was in. It was so revel. I'm telling you man. Yeah. I, I wore this tape out. Brett and Owen. And, and to your point about the undercard, which we're going to probably breeze through. Right. I, I would always fast forward kind of from the, the Brett Owen. Yeah. This is before DVDs, kids. Yeah. Okay. When it was a real simple click of that right button. Okay. You had right. to fast forward and wait, you know, t five minutes. Between these, I wore that tape out, man, when right. I, of these two matches. I, I, Ray, to me, I was a huge Sean fan, right. Michaels fan, too, as you know. And. You know, obviously, getting back to Scott Hall, Razor Ramon, I, was, I, I don't even, you know, I just call him Scott Hall at this point. Mm -hmm. You know, people kind of dog him, oh, you know, that was just, you know, Rick, that unprofessional Ric Flair round table that I referenced, I think, when we did a podcast. Oh, it was just Sean and a ladder. Ric and Flair well, had to be sniffing glue to say yeah, that. Well, and, and, or bitter, and, and I think and, that's the explanation. And, well, he, he, he doesn't like Hall and Nash yeah. for the WCW days. But um, there's some truth to that, that. Michaels was clearly the star in defeat well, he here. Was the bump machine, sure. Yes, but the fact that he was in there with a guy is over as Ramon helped this match. Right, it did. It did. The, dude, um, they were doing things. I remember going in because see, this was the first televised ladder match. They had done other right. ladder match. If you watched other ladder matches before, yeah, there were some bumps, but the ladder wasn't really a weapon. Like that, it was. I remember there's a point in this match where Razor grabs the ladder, he sets it on the apron. Okay, and he's going right. to get in, right? Sean does this slide drop kick move mm -hmm. with the, and it was just like when that happened at the time. I, I'm telling you, I, I mean, I'm getting, right. getting you're looking at me right now, like who is this deranged man? I'm doing this podcast. <laughs> with. I remember watching that at the, and just something simple like that, which now is just so commonplace and so formulatic, just blowing my. I was like, whoa, we're going to start doing. Did he just – and it's not over? You know, because, like, before yeah, in those yeah. days, it's like, oh, it my was, God, he he got a ladder kick. It was a north. transition spot. Yeah, 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 now it's like, my God, he's going to be out six months selling the ribs. And he did, and I'm just like – and I just remember it, that was the first match where – and you get a lot of these now, like kind of the Ring of Honor, like right. please don't stop chant stuff, where it was more about the performance than the storyline. You know, 
back then it's like matches the end tied into a storyline. This was the first match I can remember watching. I just didn't want it to end. I, I just wanted right. to keep seeing more performance and spots well, and, and, and where they could take it. Okay, this is where you've won me over as I think about this because it, as mind-blowing as it is to realize this, and I just did, this was uh, a little bit more than four months before Eastern Championship Wrestling became Extreme Championship Wrestling. This was the beginning of Hard. things outside the, the normal, hardcore, whatever, becoming possible. Remember in a previous uh, mini-episode, we were talking about Piper and Bad News Brown at WrestleMania six. If only they'd had that brawl in an era where more things were possible. After this match, all things this were possible. This opened Pandora's box. It did. This is, you know, and what's great is, is you know, by like 2001, 2002, the gimmick had become tired. Right. But... They did such a great job of preserving this match. For See, Rick, we're at the age, and again, not to be the grumpy old man lecturing the kids on the lawn, yeah. but they preserved this match for so long. Keep this in mind, four years after this. Right. Talk about not, they could never do this today. If they have a successful match, they'd beat it in the ground within six months. Right. Four years later, after this, they had done three ladder matches on pay-per-view only. Oh yeah, Sha- they done they, these. Sean and Razor do a rematch the following year at SummerSlam, eighteen months. Sean storyline, by the way. Well, they needed a good match for what was going to be a, right. an atrocious show, and um, and then Triple H and The Rock at SummerSlam '98. That's right. That's right. It was so, that. And, and then from there, they really there was no standout ladder match right. until the TLCs. That's so, true. I mean, for six years, the legacy of this match was protected, and because. You, it's almost a different match, though, comparing this to TLC. You're talking about two guys right. versus six guys, and those six guys went in with the explicit idea of performance over storyline. You know, it was right. by, by the time they did it at, re, at WrestleMania 17, which we'll talk about, you know, down the road. Storyline didn't matter; it was just going to be a stunt show. So, I, I guess we have them to thank for the modern thing of wrestlers. On camera, not talking about wins and losses, but thank you for giving me the match of my life last night. Yes, we can trace yeah. it back to that. In, in many there ways, you go, guys. Um, I'd like to say that the two matches in the show, yeah. two of my top four WrestleMania matches of all time. I told you Savage Steamboat was number two. Okay. Uh, I give both. That's one of only four or five star matches in WrestleMania history for me. I'm a tough okay. grader. I'm a right. tough, I said only eight get four and three quarters right. or higher. Uh, Sean Razor gets the, the, uh, the three spot where Brett Owen... Uh, gets the four spot. Okay. So and and Savage you know, number one. We'll we'll talk about in, in a little bit. Meanwhile, you know, as they as they might say over in Iran, I'm not sure that anybody would say that there's Jack Shiite on the rest of the card here. But uh, we'll we'll go. What, did, did it matter really? Well, we'll go through and we'll say, see. But I, you know, a bad, a bad undercard is something I'm going to subtract off. Of. Although I, we're moving towards that's where what at keeps least it from the other t- way below. Yeah, the, 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 that's why the, this is not a this is not a pantheon WrestleMania because of that. Although again, it's, I I it's, do it's respect. My third best. It's I do my third respect. Best. By this point in history, most matches at least had a storyline rationale for existing. I'll give them that. Uh, although it leads to crap like. Bam Bam Bigelow and Luna Vachon against Doink the Clown and Dink. Mixed tag match. Bam yeah. Bam Bam and Luna go over in 609. Which is at least they went out. Because, good God, did I hate Doink and Dink. I, I I, I'm trying to think of a comparison to how awful Doink and Dink were I, at this period. I, and I don't want to. God help me. I'm going to sound like one of these Portlandia hipsters, but a waste of two great workers in Bam Bam Bigelow and Matt Bourne. It really well, that wasn't was. Matt Bourne at that point. It was somebody else. Oh, was it somebody yeah, else? It, it, was like, right. it was It was. It was. I think Ray Lichelli or something. Yeah, was like it was Steve Kern or no? I think, I think it was. Was the, it the Brawler? Uh, it? No, no, it wasn't okay. that point. Yeah, I think it was okay. Ray Lichelli or something all right. like that. Or Robert okay, or, well, know. all right. So it wasn't that big of a waste. Uh, Randy Savage defeated Crush. Savage's last big WWF match. Falls count anywhere nine forty nine. Not a bad match. A good st- revenge storyline. The former friends again did Crush no favors, but it Crush was, sucks. It was a really good storyline, but it just. Uh, I love. Remember the Savage Crush Summit. Yeah. How, how, how political of them. Yeah. That was a good storyline. And real. how ironic that you know Savage get his throat dropped in Shades of Steamboat. Yeah, Summit. Well, at, at, at least at least Crush was a uh, a politician who was really from Hawaii. Yes, oh! You know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> as I get the disbelieving stare from Kyle Ross. Uh, I'm do my best screaming A. Smith. <laughs> How disrespectful. <laughs> Alundra Blaze Women's Champion defeated Lilani Kai in 320. The same Lilani Kai who was wrestling for the title back in the Amula days. Yeah, I feel bad. Alundra Blaze was actually somewhat over during this period. She just did not have a lot of people to work with. They did bring in uh, Bull Mac, uh, Nakano yeah. later in the year. And, and, right. But I mean, 
as a general rule, unless if you're hot and have a nice rack, no one gives a crap about women's wrestling in this company. Right, and Alondra only scored a eh, kind of on both scores. Yes, so. yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. A few Jack and Cokes in me, you know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Oh, I wouldn't even take that many, but yeah. Uh, WWF Tag Team Title Match, a true abomination. The Quebecers, Jacques and Pierre, with Johnny Polo losing by <laughs> count out to Men on a Mission, Mo and Mabel with Oscar. I think they, didn't they take a walk, too? They, they might have. They might have. Uh, Men on a Mission was obviously in a, in an, an atrocious Vince McMahon interpretation of rap music. Right. Um, the Quebecers, I, I, I love in a very manly way. See, but here's the thing, though. And we've had we've had Jacques on the show. Rem- I remember I was, like, very nervous. This was, like, when I was get, really getting smart, Markish. Uh-huh. I was like, God, I don't care. Just don't put the titles on Men on a Mission. Oh, that horrible rap gimmick. But here's the thing, Oh, yeah. Remember, that was like, you right. never understand what he was saying. Right. And and, and I, I like the stuff that uh, Jacques did on the show, and uh, he was very nice to come on and give us a great one-hour conversation on our show. Oh, I love when you bury show. past guests. It was, oh, yeah. yeah that was, but I'm not going <laughs> to bury it. But here's the thing, though. Here's my problem with this tag team. They're a good tag team, but I'm not a fan of limiting gimmicks. They should have... They're, they're, instead of bad the guys from the Quebec, Maldives. yeah, that was instead of instead of bad guys from Quebec, like I look at them like they could have carried off like a, a more, you know, well-rounded Tully and Arn kind of a thing. That's well, they what they should have been well, to me. Well, the thing is, I guess there was the Rougeau brothers, and they couldn't just re, you know. I right. loved heel Rougeau brothers. They couldn't. Right. I love the Quebec. I just, uh, you're, the gimmick was stupid, but it's one of those was, things. I just have a hard it time. It was one of those things that against all odds. Oh, they made they, it work to a decent up, amount. But. I, they had some great match. I love that match they had against one, two, three kid and Marty Jannetty, where they lose the belts earlier yeah. in the year. Great match. Yeah, that was. Uh, they, that was even something. the match where they dropped the titles of the Head Shrinkers a month right. later is pretty good. Uh, the only one that we didn't talk about yet was uh, very forgettable. Uh, Earthquake defeating Adam Bomb with Harvey Whippleman. This was, a, this was a backdrop for the Har- Howard Finkel, Harvey Whippleman feud. Cy yeah. Sperling was involved in this, for God's sakes. And again, Earthquake, we talked about this before. When they turn lukewarm heels and try and wring some, something out of them as faces. Well, remember, he, he was the post-title reign feud for Yokozuna, but it didn't work. He, like Earthquake right. tends to quit or something like well, that. Well, he ended up leaving the promotion uh, soon there. And by the way, Adam, Adam Bob, Jesus. I mean, well, who did he piss? So who, whose hand did he shake? Or, uh, 32 the shake right. seconds, yeah. yeah I, mean, I mean, somebody must have ran long here. That. Adam Bomb was always a guy I thought in those days that was gonna go somewhere. Remember, they, they just, gave him that big push as a face, and he and he was kind of remember they had like yeah. It was one of those things that they loved because they they had like the bomb squad, right? You know that they could build in like some mar- stupid. Kid. He to me would have been was like better than Crush. Yeah, you yeah. know what I'm by, saying by 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 big roided up face standards on that very generous he curve. Seems he was not he a, seems, yeah, he seems not a bad worker. He seems underrated. They, not a bad they worker. Just, they they, did, they just, dropped the ball with him. Two things worked against him. Uh, stuff like this. Uh, and the name. Jobbing him with the, uh, yeah, the name the, is The hit. name is limiting. Oh, Adam Bomb. Oh, I get it. That's yeah. so funny. <laughs> That's so funny. I get it. His name's yeah. Adam Bomb, and he's from Three Mile Island. No. Exactly. I mean, yeah, you know, this, this, was, this was a good 10 years before ROH was dabbling in the genre of stoner humor. You know, this was not a thing that uh, the WWF was, uh, you know, going to make a lot of What was that drug group they had the first year? I mean, Chad Repack, are you listening? We <laughs> used to laugh so hard that when they had those raves, in the ring and stuff like that. What was the name of that group? Don't don't know, but uh, God, was that funny? And, and, and funnier and, than the Christopher Street connection. Oh, this was wait, this was on. What was the name of that group? funnier? Funnier than the Osirian Portal. That would that would have to take a lot to be funny. God, than what was the name of that group? It was so funny because I remember the announcers came on the one time and like we hear that I can't even begin to say what they were just doing off the title belts and it was so funny. Oh fun. man, God, was it funny? Why can I not think of that name? <laughs> this and is- there was like eight hundred of them and they would just ray. God, what was that? Was so that was it was so indie, but it was so funny. We we we've we've done this before on our mini episodes here when we're talking about something as bad as up. what the undercard of WrestleMania ten was. We end up having to spice it with something more interesting at the end. <laughs> yes, but I'm sorry. I don't care what you say. Okay. All right. <laughs> so two five-star matches in and of themselves. No. Two five-star matches coupled with righting the wrongs of the previous year. Well, you, you would need the men in black mind erase thing to completely get rid of 1993, I think, to, to write the I wrongs. I think this did as good a job as you could. I, to me, it's like... 
nice, good, nice, solid there, Vince. This, this is this is dabbling the Elaine Bennis one square he beat the, on a on a yeah, diarrhea splotch. Yeah, he, he beat the guy that beat. I, I, I don't yeah. know. To me, I, I don't know. I, I guess maybe you know. And I'm a guy who's very critical about this. I, I I kind of viewed this as Brett being put on the pedestal, and, and it was they did as good a job as they could, considering that yeah, he got kind of hosed by Hogan the right. previous year. Um, but they came out of this. It's one of those shows. This show, how could this show have possibly been better? Well, well which is always one of my litmus tests. Let's say this how could also. this show have been better? Uh, the, I mean, the tag team title match. I would have put somebody else in there with the Quebecers. I, but, but to the, to the average lay person, is that going to intrigue, increase their interest in this show? No, but if you restore the value of the belts, then that they, they helps you. This, I mean, the, the tag they team were. titles, and they had not even hit their nadir yet. What, let's just say this, and we'll say this uh, to wrap on. It, it's it's very uh, fitting to, to mention this. In a run, because they were already now, uh, with, with King of the Ring, they were up to the five pay-per-views per year. They were in as bad a run of pay-per-views as horrid as I can recall. And this was this was a very good one in this, that well, this, 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 this what stood helps this, out. That's what helps this show's legacy, too. Me and the, the little fellow always agreed on this. And, and we're, we're not the only a, people. Sitting we're next not to a the, pile of diarrhea we're, makes we're it look not better? The, no, well, no, 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 okay. no, no. Okay. This, the, yes, it helps somewhat, but this is clearly the best pay-per-view of the bad era of 93 through, like, 96. Clearly. Clearly. And, and, and I think that makes this, and again, it's the bad era, so it's not on the level of, say, a WrestleMania 3 or a WrestleMania 17, which right. are on the pedestal by themselves. But it counts for something, and that's why I've got it in that, you know, this is the first WrestleMania that I've got in that neck in that top group of five. Okay. So I, and I've got it number three of all time. Number three of all time. All right, there it is. WrestleMania, uh, ten. It's gonna get. We're gonna we're gonna drop right back down to the bottom. Uh, by the way, starting with yeah. the next podcast. Yeah, exactly. Uh, when next we gather uh, to talk some uh, some graphs here, uh, the the sixth chapter of this WrestleMania is eleven through thirteen. It gets a heck of the, a lot worse. Yeah, the Nadir. Yes. Yes, you're, you're, you're going to hear us really tooling on some bad stuff, but uh, this was some pretty good stuff here. WrestleMania 10 following up on WrestleMania 9, Rick Morris and Kyle Ross. It's the Kyle Ross nine-part anthology of WrestleMania. You've been listening to part, uh, what was this, five at this point in time God here. save us all. Yeah, all right.